Okay. Hello. Good day. Welcome, everybody. My name is Can. I'm here with Lingso. And today we have Alan Hackler from Bay Maples. And uh, Alan has done the Great Water class here before. Um, so if you're interested in learning uh, the little basics of Great Water System that Alan had taught, uh, check out Lingso's community resources page and you'll find his talk titled The Same Gray Water Laundry to Landscape. Um, this is a continuation of that initial talk. Uh, so Alan has some new information for us in this talk. So welcome, Alan. The floor is all yours. Yes. Great. Well, thank you for the intro. I appreciate everyone for attending today. So my name is Alan Hackler. Um, I am the founder and owner of Bay Maples. We are a um, landscape design and construction company based in San Jose, and we specialize in doing sustainable gardens. And as part of that um, kind of ethos, we incorporate a lot of gray water and rainwater project, or gray water and rainwater systems in our projects. And this is just kind of like one tool in our toolkit to help homeowners create a more water efficient, sustainable garden. And so this presentation, is just some of the things that I've learned along the way and sort of kind of our process. So I hope people find it useful. And yeah, so I'm gonna kind of start out with, with laundry systems. I'm gonna to try to go through it kind of quickly because a lot of this information is already in my previous presentation that you can find on Lingo's website. So I'm probably gonna jam through stuff kind of quickly because I'd like to get to some slides that I didn't have previously. And I've got, I think what people will find is a pretty interesting case study of a guard we did last year. Um, so I'd like to kind of spend more time on that. So I hope that, uh, that's my spiel, my intro, and I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. Okay. So, um, what is gray water? So gray water is household wastewater coming from laundry machines, um, bathroom showers and sinks. Um, black water is from toilets, um, and kitchen sinks. And so the current gray water law was adopted in 2009. Um, gray water has always been legal in California, but 2009 is when they kind of updated and streamlined the permitting process to make these systems a lot easier to install. Um, laundry systems do not require permits, but um, whole house systems and bathroom systems do require permits. Um, so that was a major change they made back in 2019. Um, here's just a quick breakdown of sort of the um, the two types of systems. So if you've got your basic laundry system and then your, your bathroom or whole house system. Um, laundry machines are don't require permits because you're not actually changing the plumbing in your home. You're just changing the outlet pipe from the machine, um, from the line in the back of the machine. Um, bathroom systems are going to require quite a bit more uh, plumbing changes, so they do require permits. And so here's a basic schematic of your average launch the landscape system, you have your indoor plumbing section and you have your sort of exterior sort of irrigation component of a system. And this is a kind of simplified sort of drawing of what those two systems, parts of the system look like. This is sort of what the indoor configuration is gonna look like. Um, so you basically have your, your valve, which is that little brass handle in the center of the picture. That's what allows you to switch from sewer or to gray water, depending on if you're washing loads that have bleach or something you don't want to go into the uh, landscape, you can turn it and switch back to your sewer system. So this is kind of what you'll see in a finished system. Um, the nice thing about these systems is you can just simply re the machine, turn it either way to change direction of the, of the water. Um, here's just a little picture of what the two positioning of the handles are. Everything's labeled so you can see where they go. Um, and this is also located right behind the machine. So the outdoor component is going to be typically made from a three-quarter inch or one or one inch um, uh, high-density polyethylene or PVC line. Um, so this is kind of what a system looked like what before it gets buried. Um, usually going to bury below a layer of mulch, but above the soil grade. Um, and here, so once you have the main lines run, you have little what they call mulch basins. These are sort of the outlet of each pipe that's gonna be located near the uh, plants or tree that you're irrigating. Um, the idea being that you have a, a small little, what I would call almost like a, um, 
um, like a small leach field around each tree and that allows the water to outlet from the washing machine and slowly percolate in the root zone around each plant and it's going to utilize the mulch as basically like as a filter system and that allows the water to slowly percolate into the soil and allows the roots to uptake the water and this is just a simple schematic of sort of how that outlet works um, here is another kind of schematic just kind of showing the the where you would orientate the mulch basin in relation to the tree in the root zone um, and this is a schematic from um, from gray water oasis so it's a it's a book you'll see later on in my resources has a lot of great details um, and so the size of the mulch basin is going to depend on the type of soil you have the um, the more clay content you have in your soil, the larger your mulch basin should be to accommodate the water percolating in the soil. So as you can see, a clay soil is going to be quite a bit bigger, four or five times bigger than, than a sand, a heavy sand uh, soil. Um, and so with this, with this uh, kind of um, this ratio of size, you're going to be, let's say you had a 20 gallon machine, each mulch basin is going to be roughly uh, two or three square feet. Um, and so it's basically, you, you know, going to be irrigating maybe four to six trees. Um, and that's going to be about an, what one load of wash can accommodate. So these are very rough numbers. Every site is going to be a little bit different, but this gives you a quick rule of thumb for how big your mulch basin should be. Um, and so Mulch basin is a fancy word for just basically more or less a hole around the tree. Um, this is what the hole will look like before it gets, um, before you dig out the mulch basin, before you have the outlet cover and the tree planted. This is the outlet line coming from the washing machine. You'll see the, the purple ball valve. So purple just indicates that it's gray water um, and has a ball valve at the end of the line. So you can sort of augment the flow coming out of the machine. So that way one outlet doesn't get more water than the other. Um, and so once you've got your hole dug, this is your, your mulch basin cover before the um, planting and mulch has been backfilled. And again, the mulch basin cover has a simple purple cover. So indicating that it's gray water. The idea of the mulch basin is it keeps mulch from um, filling in around the outlet and that by keeping the mulch away from it, it limits the roots from growing into the outlet pipe. And here is after the mulch has been added. So, you know, very simple um, setup, very easy to do. Even a, a homeowner can do this over as a weekend project. Um, this will be kind of what the final um, configuration of the mulch basin outlet will look like. All the pipes will be buried. All you'll see is just the top of the mulch basin outlet and indicated by the purple cover. Um, and here's what, 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 when you lift up the lid up from the the mulch basin, this is basically what you'll see inside the box, just your simple outlet pipe. If you notice, there's a, there's a, there's a gap between the outlet and the mulch below, and that gap is what um, inhibits the roots from growing into the outlet pipe. Without that gap, you will definitely have roots growing up the um, half inch line into the main line of the system and clogging things. So keeping that little gap there really helps to maintain the integrity of the system and limit clogging. So maintenance, so every, you know, once, twice a year, you want to open the lids up to make sure that the, there's no roots growing in there. You can pull out any laundry lint and debris. So you can lift up this little, this little cap here, uh, make sure things are flowing out correctly, um, make sure this, the, that there's still a gap between the outlet pipe and the mulch, um, pull out any debris, um, laundry lint, um, hair, you know, whatever comes out of the machine. It's a little on the gross, funky side, but you want to do it once a year just to make sure that the system is working properly, um, just to get the most benefit from it. Um, so gray water soaps. So one of the more important things to consider when you're doing this kind of system is to make sure you're using soaps that are going to work well with your soil. You don't want to have, um, any uh, bleach or sulfides or phosphates building up or boron, which is a, uh, which is a um, salt. Um, salt buildup in your soil can inhibit root growth and also make nutrients unavailable for the roots to, to absorb because it throws off your pH. 
So it's really important to make sure you are using gray water compatible soaps. Um, and these are a few that I recommend. Ecos, you can find them as anywhere. Oasis is another brand you can find online. Um, so yeah, these are a couple of one. But nowadays you can go to literally almost any grocery store and find um, uh, organic soaps that don't have any uh, phosphates or boron. So there's a lot of options nowadays. You don't have to uh, look too hard to find these kind of uh, products. And so one of the other considerations too with doing these um, systems is Many times when you're running your um, pipe from your washing machine out into your garden, you have to navigate around a piece of concrete around your house. So there are several techniques. You can either cut the concrete with a saw like we did in this picture. You can also trench underneath the concrete, which can be um, a little more time consuming, but doesn't require any specialized um, tools. You don't have to worry about using a concrete saw. The, the easiest, but not necessarily the most preferred, is you can just run the pipe on top of the concrete, which um, in many circumstances is okay, but you just have to then just kind of navigate around the pipe, you know, maybe just to make, some people may consider a tripping hazard or maybe visually unappealing, but it's the most cost effective. It's also allows it to be, um, it's more temporary. So if the system ever was changed or moved, it gives you a lot more options in the future. If the walkway is in an area of the house that's not a heavily trafficked area, if it's on like on a side fence, that may not be an issue for some people. But just something to consider is how you want to navigate around the concrete around the side of the house, depending on where your washing machine is located. So this was an example where we just use a simple concrete saw, backfill it with some rocks that the client had on site, and this is a really easy solution. Every house is going to have a little bit of a different scenario to navigate around. Some houses don't have any kind of concrete, and you can go right into the ground which is the preferred method, but just kind of something to consider when you're doing systems. And one thing I don't want to forget about too, is when you're deciding what part of the garden you want to irrigate um, for a laundry system, your washing machine can pump about 50 feet because these systems are utilizing the pump inside the machine. And those pumps are designed to only have a 50 foot um, pumping ability so you want to make sure that whatever you're irrigating kind of stays within that sort of uh, that parameter so you're not overtaxing your pump. And so this is um, just something to keep in mind. Um, so here's another example of kind of building the mulch basin. So this is a fruit tree that we, an apple tree. And so you want to kind of dig your hole and you can sort of see how big the, the, the depending on what size pot, this is a five gallon pot. So you want to accommodate, you know, so most mulch basins are going to be about two to three foot square. Um, and so, you know, just digging the hole and placing the plant in there, you can kind of get a rough idea of how big your mulch basin needs to be. Um, and then once you've got your kind of hole dug, you can, you can backfill a little bit, but keeping some space for the mulch, you want to mix in some of the native soil with the soil that came from the nursery pot. Um, and then once you have that in, then you add your mulch basin cover and your mulch. So in this instance, we use an old one gallon pot for the mulch basin outlet, which is definitely a um, solution for a homeowner. If you're looking to kind of keep costs down, you don't need to buy a fancy outlet cover. It can be something can be, you know, more on a DIY style and just use an old one gallon pot. I'm sure all of you gardens out there have a million of these one gallon pots sitting on the side of the house somewhere. Um, and these are, so this is the finished layout. Um, so as you see in this example, I think we have uh, four trees and a um, blackberry vine and a little espalier plant on the fence. So this is about how much you might see in a household that's got maybe four to five people and they're doing about maybe anywhere from three to four loads a week. Um, this is, so I, I always tell people to figure your um, your gray water is going to be like one particular zone of your irrigation system. It's never going to be able to totally um, offset your full irrigation in your front or your backyard, but consider it kind of one of the zones on your in, in your uh, garden. And so this is kind of like your your fruit tree zone, um, depending on you know how your your garden is, is located. But this is just a rough example. This is an example of like a rough uh, configuration of plants that you could use. Um, so system costs. So over the last couple of years, some of these costs have gone up a little bit. Um, some of the mat plastic materials and um, installation materials in general have gone up a little bit. So our cost for doing this is around $25 or $3,500. Um, 
Most home, homeowners, if they're doing the labor themselves, you can buy these parts for as cheap as $300 and the rest of the cost is just your personal labor. But this is this can change quite a bit, but this is just a rough idea of what you can expect for these kinds of systems. Um, here are some resources that I recommend. These are all really great organizations. Um, some of the Greywater Action is great for training. Same thing with Greywater Alliance. Um, Urban Farmers is a great spot for getting parts. Um, yeah, and then some other places for rebates and some additional information and parts below. Um, and I think all this information, um, I think we're going to make the this presentation available later on. So if you don't catch this in my slide, you can refer to this later and get all these addresses and information. I am going through some of these kind of quickly because we covered this on our last talk and I'd like to get to some other really useful stuff here. So if you feel like I'm going too fast, this presentation will be evergreen. You can view it again. Um, and a lot of this information is also iterated on some of these links that you can find too. And at the end of this, we'll answer some of your questions too. So if you, just in case you're not getting all this, I'm going kind of quickly. Um, so yeah, so, so the, that is sort of the non-permitted type systems. And then when it comes to the permitted systems, which are your bathroom systems, the reason why these are going to require a permit is because you're modifying sort of this sewage and drain lines underneath the house. So anytime you are modifying um, your, your sewer and drain system under the house, um, it's going to require a permit and should definitely involve a licensed plumber or a very experienced gray water installer. Um, this is not something I would recommend by the average DIY person unless they have pretty extensive construction and plumbing experience. Um, there are a whole lot of ways you can mess this up if you're not experienced. So in my opinion, it's not worth the money saved by trying to do it yourself. Definitely have a plumber be involved. Um, and this is a great picture to show what sort of the plumbing looks like, but I guarantee you this is not what the bottom of your house looks like. Um, it definitely will not be this well lit and probably very, um, <clears throat> a lot more constricted space wise and probably more spiders and bugs and critters down there. But this just gives you a sense of what the plumbing looks like when you get down there. So basically when you're doing these kind of systems, the, the main objective is to separate your shower and sink lines away from the toilet lines. And so when you're going into your house, you're basically identifying which are the sewer lines, which are the shower and bathroom lines and isolating those and then your shower and sink lines will now go towards a either a branch drain type system or into a filtered um, basin with a pump in it and that will pump the water out into your landscape. So a couple things to keep in mind that I to mention with this and also with laundry systems is if you have, if your house is located on or if your house is built on a concrete slab a lot of these gray water options will probably not be available to you because all this plumbing is happening inside your concrete slab. So unless you're already planning to cut up your concrete for, for some kind of a remodel or retrofit, most of these systems or basically all these systems are going to be kind of cost prohibitive um, and just are going to require too much modification to make it worth it. So, you know, anyone who's built houses on a concrete slab, this, these options probably won't be available to you, but launch landscape systems still will be possible. So just kind of want to put that caveat out there for some people. So I'm going to start with sort of the, the more simple of the um, bathroom whole house type systems, which is called a branch drain system. And basically this is a gravity feed system. So your traditional, you know, plumbing system, everyone's home as it is now, every time you take a shower, use a sink, use a toilet, when you flush it or when the water goes down the drain, it's all gravity fed. So it's all gonna gravity feed into your sewer main line from your house and down into the municipal sewer supply. So in this system, you're using that same concept and you're sending all your gray water into your garden area via a gravity system using the same ABS pipes that you would and that we'd use in most uh, traditional sewer systems. So you're taking that same basic plumbing concept and then just sending that water out into your garden. And very similar to the um, three-way valve we saw in the laundry system, this system is going to use a three-way valve as well. Um, just a larger one that's going to use a three-inch versus a one-inch, or in some situations a four-inch. And what this does is allows you to 
switch your drain line so it can always revert back to your sewer. So if there's ever a time when you don't want your wastewater from your shower or sink to go to your garden, you can simply hit a switch and switch back to your sewer connection and this will run back out to the municipal sewer supply. Um, unlike a laundry system where that switch is right behind your machine, your three valve will be located underneath the house with these kind of systems. So if you notice that little blue box here, just, I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but there's a blue box that just controls a very simple motor, which will turn the handle. And that motor is controlled by a switch in the bathroom via a low voltage wire. And that just allows someone to um, flip that switch very similar to you would turn a light switch. And so if you're about to take a shower or someone is cleaning your bathroom tub or your sink, or you're using your, maybe you're dyeing your hair and you don't want that water to go down the sink or down the shower, you can flip that switch, send that water right to the sewer. When you're done, flip the switch back and then the, the, the um, loads or shower and sink use will go down the, back down your gray water system. So this allows you to just control the flow um, if there's any toxic or just any, any chemicals that you don't want to go into your bathroom or down into your, your um, landscape. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you get. Those are the sort of the components that are, you're going to, the user will be interfacing with, but in the landscape side of things, this is sort of the sort of the infrastructure that you'll be installing to make the system work. Um, because this is a gravity system, you're, you're using gravity to split the flow of the water to each zone or outlet basin. And these are basically, let me see if I can get a picture. So if you see, this is what they call a double L splitter. And this is what's going to be located in these little boxes. So the, um, the beauty of this system is in its simplicity. There are no pumps, there are no filters, there are no specialized parts. Basically all these parts of the system you could buy from a simple plumbing store and an irrigation supply store. So in that respect, they are very low tech. Um, almost anyone can install this system. We've got a little bit of you know irrigation experience, um, or at least on the landscape side of things. Um, and so what these do is, as the, if you can see the ver at the bottom of the page, um, the water is coming from um, the shower or sinks and it hits this little flow splitter and the water will be divided into each one of these lateral lines. Um, and so the challenge with this is that flow splitter needs to be exactly level and, and sort of flat sitting right at the orientation that you want the flow to, to go to either direction. So as- hey, Alan. Uh, Sorry, yeah. I'm gonna, um, uh, the slides went away. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe you just need to reshare it or something. No problem, no problem. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem, no, thank you for letting me know. Can everyone see it still or no? No, uh, we're seeing you, but not the slides. They, they okay, just, okay, just sorry about that, let me- uh, let me just go back here. Sorry about that. How are we doing? Perfect. Yeah, I think uh, we were at a different slide, maybe. Yeah, so I think I was kind of looking at this one. Oh, there sorry we go. That, yes. Thanks for the, the heads up, Ken. Sure. Um, yeah, so the with this system, you're with the there's a bit of a trade-off you get the benefit of having it be very simple and low tech but you're kind of at the mercy of the ground um kind of working with you to not move we, you know as some because we're all living earthquake country you can get these little flow splitters to be just level but over time they can shift and one of the things to limit that is you have this little um where we have this little threaded half inch plug is you can unthread this and that allows you to view the water flowing through the pipe. So in the future, if you're unsure of if the water is flowing correctly as it needs to, you can unscrew this. You can view the water coming down the pipe and you can make any needed changes. So that is kind of one of the, the pluses of these systems. Um, so one of the, and so here is a system kind of as we're configuring it. 
so you know with any all these different gray water systems have their sort of trade-offs um this one one of the benefits is is cost um but one of the limitations is your own your Kind of beholden to um, how much gravity you can maintain from the bathrooms to the garden so you can only irrigate sections of the house where you can still maintain that one to two percent um, slope the further you get away from the house the deeper those trenches need to be and the more likelihood you need to navigate around roots or patios or fence lines or a whole you know multitude of different things so um, those are kind of the things to consider when you're choosing a system to see what works best for you. Um, in some some instances, these systems can work out great if they have a if the home is set up in a way where there's not a lot of obstructions. You have a nice gentle grade. Um, some instances not. You might need to go through a pump system. So you know every system needs to be evaluated to see what's going to be the best configuration for them. Um, but I always like to present this example because um, some people really love the kind of low tech, simple systems. Um, but you can also only irrigate a small number of plants because you can only split the water maybe about four or five times. Um, and then at that point you're dealing with two. So every time you split, so you're getting 50%, so 50% of the water. And so once you get to uh, the, the quarter and eighth splits, you're only dealing with a small, maybe, you know, a gallon to water. And to keep dividing the flow at that point, it's really um, not to your benefit. So with these systems, you can expect to irrigate, I would say in the neighborhood of maybe eight to 12 plants, um, depending on how much water you're producing. And so here's a few more pictures. If you notice at the end of this run, there's a small clean out to clean and um, manage the system. And very similar to what we had before, you have these little mulch basins everywhere. You see these little branches coming out. They call this a branch drain system because of these little branch kind of side lateral runs where the mulch basins are. And then here is sort of that same project site after we have backfilled and added soil. So if you look at all the little fruit trees on the sides and the small uh, plants here, those are all the water, the plants that are receiving the uh, flow of water. If you notice the the house on you have these two pipes that are coming down from the second floor and there's another pipe that's coming down right behind sort of where the barbecue is located and those are where the bathrooms are and the water is gravity feeding from those two bathrooms to the trees here in the side garden and this is just one example of how you can and the nice thing about this is the garden is in very close proximity to the bathroom so this branch drain system really lended itself well to this the configuration of this house. And so here's just another view of that same garden. So pros and cons, very simple, inexpensive, no electricity, you know, it can be sold off grid, um, no specialized parts. You can buy almost any of these parts at a hardware store and irrigation supply store. So those are the, the benefits. Some of the cons, um, you know, like I said earlier, if you have a slab foundation, it's not possible can be very labor intensive because there's a lot of trenching. So you're digging um, a lot in these gardens. Um, there's a lot of kind of trial and error with getting the grade just right. Make sure that the, uh, the double L's are split just right. So there can be a lot of like kind of trial and error. But for, you know, if you're a homeowner or, you know, just doing this as a weekend project and, and the labor isn't the most expensive part of the project, that might not be a downfall to a lot of people. So it just kind of depends on the project and the budget and time and knowledge constraints of whoever is installing the system. Um, so now I'm gonna go on to pumped systems. Um, so this is kind of the part of the system I'm excited to share with everyone. Um, so this, in my opinion, is sort of the optimal configuration of doing this kind of system. Um, and why I say that is because this system has a couple benefits that I thought are a, um, just a really great um, example of how you can really optimize your total water savings for a home garden because this system utilizes not only a gray water system but it also uses a rainwater system and this is also a pump system so it has a pump that catches the water from uh, two bathrooms and also the laundry machine and then once the water is caught in a basin it gets filtered and then sent out through a garden 
And this picture shows the front and backyard. Um, you know, just in the looks of it, it just looks like a typical kind of drought tolerant garden that you would see that kind of becoming more commonplace. Um, but it's irrigated with gray water and rainwater versus potable water. So I think this shows an example of how you can still have an attractive looking garden um, and still not have a large uh, water footprint. So this garden was installed this past summer um, in about uh, May or June. So it's not even a full year old yet. I took these pictures about a month ago. Um, so you can see the plants are just starting to fill in. And yeah, and so this is just, I wanna kind of walk you through the process and kind of see how we did this. Um, so the project background. So here's just some before pictures of the project. As you can see, it was just kind of a dead lawn. Um, backyard, they'd also let a lot of the plants die. So the homeowner reached out to me and said, hey, you know, because the, the water restrictions from the water district, we have stopped watering our front and backyard garden. But the downside is now everything looks dead and it's not very appealing, but they're very avid gardeners. They really like to um, do edible gardening. They had some fruit trees. They wanted to add more fruit trees, but they felt like they wouldn't be able to do that with the watering restrictions and didn't want to feel um, that they were being wasteful with water. So they called me and said, hey, you know, what are, I, I see you do gray water and rainwater systems. What are some options that you can help us out with? Because we'd love to find a way to cut down our water, but still have a good looking lush garden. Um, so this was a home in South San Jose area, family of four. And so they really, um, these were really fantastic clients. They really gave me a lot of creative freedom to come up with some solutions that would work for their home. Really their, their main goal was we want to have a garden and cut down on water. What can you do? And so it was a really fun process to work with them to find some solutions. And I will walk you through and show you what we came up with. Um, so whenever I'm doing, you know, meeting a client for the first time, I'm always kind of, you know, meeting with, with them, doing a walkthrough of the site, hearing their needs and concerns and kind of looking for solutions. Um, and so they had this, you know, everyone's got this kind of, you know, the unused side of the house where it's just kind of like a utility area where they got maybe their gas meter or maybe their trash can store, or maybe some old tools. And I find this to be a great spot to, um, put some of the equipment, you know, whenever we're putting in rainwater systems, I, I think I've, I don't think I've ever heard a person say they enjoy the look of a rain tank or the gray water equipment. It's not necessarily the most attractive thing. Um, so always looking for ways we can hide it somewhere in the house. And this is a, you know, um, a great option. We're just kind of stuck it in on the side of the house where this is sort of the opposite side where they have their main gate entrance where they, you know, is their main thoroughfare. So they very, they very rarely walk on the side of the house. So utilizing this area for the tanks and the gray water equipment was um, a really good solution for them because they weren't really giving up any of their usable space. And so this, and, and <coughs> excuse me. And secondly, this house was um, in close proximity to where the master bathroom and guest bathrooms were. So it was really kind of the perfect scenario for where you could put some rain tanks and a gray water system. Um, so in this system, we have, um, we, we put six 420 gallon rain tanks, and we also put a aqua loop gray water filter system. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to promote, um, aqua loop. There's a lot of great uh, systems out there. We've installed a lot of them. Um, this, what sets this aqua loop system apart from other systems is it is an NSF certified system. And I'll show that another slide. Um, so basically what this does is it allows the water, it, it filters it to a slightly higher degree than other systems. Um, so one of the caveats with the, the new gray water code is you can't store gray water because it goes anaerobic and um, you can't use it for overhead spray. Well, with this system, you'll, you'll see in the next couple of slides, it gives you a lot more options. Um, and so, um, this of those six tanks one of the tanks is for holding gray water the other five tanks are for rainwater and so you can see in the slide this the one that's near where the filter system is that is going to be our gray water holding tank so this was just a really um is a perfect solution to hide all this equipment here so going to the next slide so this aqua loop um, product it is the only nsf uh, nsf 350c certified it's got a mouthful system 
And so basically that is basically saying that this gray water can be used for overhead spray and for non-potable indoor use. Non-potable indoor use basically uh, means for toilet flushing and for laundry use. So you can actually take your gray water, filter it, and then send it back into the house to be reused. Um, and you'll see in some other slides of what kind of benefits you can get from that. So I don't want to just jump up to over the place. But this is this was the system that we were using. And here you'll see another kind of cutaway schematic of the system. Um, and you'll be able to see this in the next slide coming up as well. So basically, you have a little um, holding tank. And the filter you, you see right here will actually sit inside of the tank. And that is what's going to basically be purifying the water. There's also a small pump in there, which will pump the water out of the tank. And let me get to this slide. So this is actually inside of the basin. If you look at the slide on the right, that little filter unit actually sits down inside of that tank. And if you look where you can see where we have the gray water is coming from the house via a three inch ABS pipe. It goes through that little pre-filter and then it goes into the main filter at the bottom of this tank. And so I'll go back to the previous slide. Um, and so all this equipment you're seeing right here is what's sitting down inside of that, that tank that the picture is. So this is just kind of a cutaway showing what the different, um, what the different components of the system are. And so just kind of a rundown of the system details. We have six 420 gallon Bushman tanks. They don't have to be Bushman tanks. That's just what we used for this particular system. Um, and it collects water from two bathrooms and a laundry sink. And the nice thing about filtering the water to potable levels is you don't need, uh, so most of these pump systems, there is a whole variety of, of pump systems on the market. All of those pump systems require a special gray water appropriate drip irrigation. Um, and sometimes if you've ever seen the purple pipe water, you see it many times in uh, commercial or in municipal um, scenarios. And anywhere we see that like purple pipe or the little purple sign or the purple cap, that's all signifying that that is irrigation designed to use reclaimed water. The nice thing about this system is you can use a traditional uh, drip line, you can use overhead spray, you can use the exact same controllers you have now, um, same irrigation valves. So one of the challenges with these gray water systems, you know, someone will, the, the, one of the calls that I get very often is, hey, I've got an existing lawn or a garden, and I want to kind of, you know, obey some of the new watering restrictions, but I don't want to have to rip out my whole garden in lieu of putting in a gray water system or rainwater system. And so many times, one of the reasons why people opt to not do a gray water system is because not only are they paying to have the gray water system put in, but they also have to pay to basically redo their whole landscape because they need to put in a whole new drip system. And so lots of times the additional cost of and the burdensome of having to redo the landscape can be a bit of a, a, a non-starter for some people. So the beauty of this particular system is you can use all your existing um, um, components. So you can keep your same controller, your same valves, all the same overhead spray. Even though I don't really recommend overhead spray, if you do have existing ones you don't want to change out, you can put a system in like this without having to totally modify all of that. So that to me is a really great selling point for a lot of people. Um, so in this little schematic here, um, you can kind of see where the water, this kind of breaks down and maybe hopefully it's not too confusing for people, but you have the, you know, bathroom one and two, which flows into the tank, the, the initial I'm going to go back a slide here. So it flows into this little tank right here, which is basically what you see the, uh, the bio, what's in this slide, what we're calling the bioreactor tank. So it flows in that bioreactor. From there, it's going to go into the gray water storage tank. And if from your gray water storage tank, it is going to come out with this brown pipe is. And that is going to, uh, let me see what's a good slide. I'm going to go back a couple, I'm sorry. Jump around. There, it, sometimes these systems can be a little bit tricky to uh, describe via a Zoom call. So I'm out to jump around a little bit. I apologize. But so once it goes to this little bioreactor tank at the bottom, if you see this brown pipe that kind of goes up along the side of the tank, 
that is going to be your filtered um, gray water. It can actually be stored in that tank. So in most other systems, you cannot store the gray water. You're basically having to use the gray water within 24 hours of it being created. With this system, you can actually store that gray water. And so once it goes into that holding tank, you can basically use this water as if it were just a traditional water source to irrigate your garden. And so that is a, to me, a really big selling point. It offers you a lot more choices for um, how and when you irrigate, what zones irrigate, how much water irrigate per irrigation cycle, what days of the week you want to irrigate. I mean, a whole host of different, you know, um, options and flexibility for how you, you know, use the water in your garden. So that to me is a really great selling point for most homeowners. Um, so going back, so, um, so to explain the system in more detail, so you've got basically three um, stages of filtration. So the water will go through this, um, if you see, I'm referring to the second slide right here. So the, that little tank that's kind of buried in the ground, that's our bioreactor tank. It's gonna go through an initial pre-filter. That pre-filter is gonna catch some of the um, kind of larger particulate, typically, you know, hair, maybe shaving cream, shaving stubble, things like that. It's gonna catch that, separate it from the rest of the water. And then the water will flow down into the bottom of the tank through the, the larger um, filter I showed you in the other slides and then go through here. So, so our three phases of filtration. So it's gonna go to this first pre-filter. It's called a pure, pure rain as a manufacturer. Um, um, and then basically this pre-filter is just catching some of the largest, biggest debris getting out of the system. And what this does is it takes some of the, um, the it, 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 it removes some of the uh, filtration capacity of the other, the secondary filters. So that way that second filter is not working so hard and now, you know, you're not having to clean it so often. So having this initial stage of filtration really helps that. And so once it goes to this pre-filter, it goes through this membrane filter. And this membrane filter is gonna get kind of the more finer particulate. Um, it's gonna catch a lot of the um, kind of microbes, you know, small little filters that the pre-filter the pre doesn't catch. Once it goes to this pre-filter, this, this is kind of where the magic of this system is. So basically it's the bioreactor tank, the reason I'm, I'm referring to it as a bioreactor tank is this is basically very similar to how a compost system is gonna break down um, you know, food bacteria or, you know, food and leaves. It's basically using beneficial bacteria and beneficial microbes to basically eat the rest of the organic matter in the gray water. And so if you notice, it has these little kind of plastic, little, little kind of oval balls. And what those do is those little oval balls basically just give habitat for microbes to populate. And so those little microbes are there just to break down any of the other um, bacteria and organic matter that you don't want in your system. And this system basically uses these little plastic media and air. So it uses a large air blower like you'd see in a fish tank, but a, a much larger one. And by pumping a lot of air into this bioreactor, you are just able to kind of um, stimulate the beneficial bacteria growth. And that beneficial bacteria is basically eating your gray water. So it is basically like a living cleaning mechanism. And you'd be amazed, like sometimes with some of these systems, we open up these gray water tanks and they, to be honest, are not the most pleasant things to deal with. This system, when it's, when it's, when it's working as it should and it's cleaning well, you can lift this lid up and you can literally stick your water, you can stick your hand right in this gray water and it doesn't stink, it doesn't smell. Um, which I would never do that with most systems. I would usually never touch it with my bare hands. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really encourage people to use this system because it offers so many more um, options for how you can clean and manage your gray water. And so once it goes through this kind of bioreactor filter treatment, the, if you see on the, on the side here, there's a little brown pipe. And that little brown pipe is just a half inch poly line. And there's a pump at the bottom of the bioreactor once the, the gray water is gonna sit in this bioreactor for about a day, and that's really all it needs to filter it to a level where you can then store the water. And the gray water will simply be stored in one of these 420 gallon tanks. And from there, 
you will have, if you see in the slide on the right, there is just a small one horse power, one half horsepower pump. And that is basically what is powering your um, irrigation. And it's basically gonna send the water from the tank out into irrigation. And so when I was mentioning the oxygen that's gonna be pumping into the bioreactor tank, it's this little green box here. And that is just a, a kind of heavy duty uh, fish tank air blower that you'd find at any kind of aquatic um, um, store. And that's basically what is pumping oxygen into the tank and keeping the beneficial bacteria alive. So this is kind of the brains of the system, I would say. Then up here is your controller. The controller is just monitoring the pump and the water flow to make sure everything is working as, as needed. Um, there are a couple of small sensors that talk to this controller um, with the um, with the float switch. So once the bioactive tank is full, it'll trip a float switch and it'll send that water into the holding tank. So this is kind of you know where all the magic happens. And then so like I was saying before, is this gray water because it gets filtered to this higher level than most gray water systems, you can then use this filtered gray water to then pump into your toilets. And that to me is a great um, benefit because you can, you know, in most gray water systems in the winter time, when you don't have a really high demand for gray water in your garden, you know, like, oh, well, what, what am I going to do with this water? In many instances, people just turn the gray water system off in the winter. And so it's a bit of a lost opportunity. It's like, hey, I've got this system and I'm creating gray water. It's a shame I can't use it in my garden. With a system like this, you can be using that gray water in indoors even during the rainy season so to me you're kind of getting a little more bang for your buck and you're able to offset more of your overall potable water footprint so you know wh whenever you're looking at a system like this you want to kind of look at your overall water usage it doesn't really matter if the water gets used for landscaping or for um, toilet flushing or for laundry or for cooking you know you kind of have one overall number of gallons you're you're using and creating in your home so the more of that overall usage you can offset, whether it's from gray water or rainwater, you know, the more kind of water savings you can achieve. So if you're able to offset more water in the wintertime, you're cutting into your overall yearly water usage. So I think it's a really good way to kind of look at that. So in most gray water systems, you don't get that benefit of kind of offsetting that winter water. So this is a great, you know, additional benefit of these kind of systems. And let me see if I have a... Picture. Yeah, so there's a little close up of that of that pump. And so if you look, um, I've got some of these arrows kind of pointing out some of the different outlets. The you can kind of see the line that kind of goes, there's a blue pipe that goes back under the house. So that's basically a PEX uh, potable line that you, that we use for this, even though it's for non-potable. It's PEX is a very typical um, material used for just potable water systems. And we're running this pipe back under the house, which then gets used for toilet flushing and for laundry. And then the other line you see, which is a gray Schedule 80 pipe that goes to our front and backyard um, irrigation systems. And so, yeah, and so this is a close up of that same controller. So this just kind of tells you, um, making sure the pump and the, and the filters are working correctly. So this is just kind of your monitoring station. And you can see here's a close up of the um, air filter as well, too. So let me just go to the next slide. So I'm going to got still got a bunch more slides. I don't want to bore you guys too much. So I'm going to try and keep moving along. So here is the connection for that same line inside the house. And so this is a very typical angle stop you'll see in any behind any toilet, any bathroom. And so this is what's called a dual plumb system. So you've got the the line that's on the floor is our new gray water inlet from the gray water system. And so if you notice, there's two, you've got the original angle stop and the new one. And if there's ever a scenario where your power goes out, you don't want to not be able to flush a toilet because the pump outside isn't on because there's no power. You can simply disconnect this line screw it right back into the old municipal line and you can still have functional toilets even during a power outage or some kind of a catastrophic pump failure. So this is kind of a, 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 a dual safe kind of connection so that you always have access to water for toilets in the case of emergency. Excuse me. Yes, okay. So 
And then you also have your potable water makeup. So if there ever a period of time where you're out of town or no one is occupying the home, but you still need to send gray water or send irrigation to your system, you have a potable makeup, which will send water into the, um, the gray water system to provide that makeup water so you can still irrigate things. So this is your, there's a little solenoid right here. You see this gray line connects back into the box where the controller is. And if, at the, the, there's a flow switch inside the tank, which will um, pick up if there is not enough gray water, it'll open up the municipal water line and send that makeup water into your tank. So this is what this little solenoid does. And yeah, so this is also the rainwater component of the system. And so when there isn't gray water um, being created, it will then revert over to the rainwater system. And when there's no rainwater, then the, the third sort of level of you know, water will be the municipal. So it's always gonna look for the water, it gets the, the gray water first, then rainwater, then municipal. That's kind of the hierarchy of water usage. Um, and this just kind of shows the inlet for the, uh, the rainwater system. And the beauty of this system is it just uses a, a typical off-the-shelf hunter controller. So you don't need to buy a um, proprietary controller from the manufacturer. You can use the same controller that you have already in your home or a, a controller you would buy from a box store or an um, irrigation supply house. And same thing with the Netafim line. So this is a Netafim tech line, which is a kind of... Uh, coming sort of industry standard for any kind of drip line for drought tolerant gardens or even uh, traditional gardens that aren't drought tolerant. Um, so you can run this gray water through any type of Netafim or a micro sprayers or even overhead sprayer. So, but in this particular system, we use a Netafim um, irrigation line. Um, and so system maintenance. So this is that um, membrane that's gonna be inside the um, bioreactor. And it's kind of funny, this picture it just looks like a, 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 some yarn that was just all kind of tied up. But the idea is all those little, um, the little filter wires, it kind of creates a network that basically catches all of the sort of gray water sludge coming out of the uh, system. And so the, base, the basic mains of the system is pulling out this little cartridge, taking a high pressured hose, and giving it uh, a nice heavy spray, maybe every two to three months. Um, and so the more often you can do this and keep this nice and clean, the, the better functioning your system will be. But besides that, this is really the only maintenance the system will require. Every so often you can dunk this in some hydrogen peroxide to give it an extra thorough clean. Um, but this is, so I always equate it to sort of having your, your pool service a um, couple times a year or having a water softener recharged a couple times a year. So it's very similar um, maintenance on par with this other kind of household water uh, fixtures. So very simple, nothing that's uh, um, too complicated for the average DIY homeowner or handyman or um, landscape professional. Um, yeah, so one of the benefits of the system, as I mentioned before, you can use all your existing irrigation components you can, even though I don't really promote lawns, you can still irrigate a lawn with this system without having to remove the lawn and putting in a whole new subsurface um, irrigation system. That can, you know, many times people call me and want to use gray water for a lawn. And one of the biggest downsides of that is you have to remove the lawn, put in a subsurface irrigation, and then reinstall the lawn. And that's, it, it can be a bit wasteful and cost prohibitive. So the beauty of these systems is you can keep all that lawn in place, keep the irrigation in place and still use it with this uh, gray water system. So to me, it's a great selling point. Um, you can, you, this system can also be utilized with the rainwater system um, and you can store the gray water. Those are some, some benefits that not a lot of the gray water systems can, um, you can utilize with their system. So one of the reasons why I really like this and I'm not promoting this particular brand, I'm just kind of promoting this basic concept. So I want to kind of make that clear. I'm not trying to push for this brand, but just the idea of being able to filter the gray water to this level really offers a lot of advantages. Yes, and so, you know, the these systems, I will be honest, are not necessarily a inexpensive endeavor, but some ways to incorporate a system like this without spending more money than is needed and a way to streamline some of the costs is 
um, just to make sure that you're incorporating in a time that makes sense or you're, you have a home that makes sense or you're, you know, just making sure that the parameters of the project, it just, you know, you can optimize things. So one, um, you know, are you even creating enough grain order to make, to make these systems worthwhile? You know, I've got a lot of empty nesters that call me and it's just two people. Um, kids are out of the home. Kids are usually the ones who use the most amount of gray water. And so, you know, I feel like the, the older you get, the more wise you are about how you use water. And so sometimes if it's only two people living in the home and they don't have kids, maybe a gray water system isn't worth it. So it's always going to find out, are you even using enough gray water to make it worth it? So that's something that's really important to kind of do like a water audit before you start to find out if it's, if it's worthwhile. Um, also, you want to make sure, can you make grade to plumb to, to your sewer system will make grade to the tank? Um, you make sure you're not on a crawl space. So these are all things that a plumber can help you out with or a really, I would only hire plumbers who have very specific, specific knowledge of gray water. Most plumbers are not going to want to deal with these kind of systems, I can tell you from experience. So make sure you have not only that they've experienced with plumbing, but have very specific gray water experience on these pump systems. I cannot emphasize that enough. I've worked with a lot of systems who are with great plumbers who have a lot of experience, who are doing things correctly, but unless that plumber knows gray water systems specifically, I can assure you they, not any fault to anybody, probably will not install these systems right because a lot of these systems are, are not what plumbers are traditionally taught when they become plumbers. So lots of times they just, they don't know all the intricacies of these systems. So if you are using a plumber, really make sure they've got some gray water experience. I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and so one thing that, that is a really um, great way to um, time the installation of these systems is doing it when there's already gonna be a large remodel of the house or a remodel of at least one of the bathrooms. Because if there's already going to be a large construction project or remodel project happening, you can piggyback a lot of the costs. So if they're already getting plumbing permits, they're already opening up the floors, they're already crawling under the house, and these things are going to be happening anyways, you can do a lot of the gray water work to make this, your house gray water ready at the same time. And so that, that, can, that can save you thousands and thousands of dollars. And also not on just the plumbing side, on the permitting side, on the material side, so that's a really great time to, to do these systems. Even if you're not ready to, to do the landscape component of these systems, you can at least make your plumbing system under your home gray water ready. So I really encourage people, if you're gonna be doing a, a, a remodel or a new construction project or a bathroom retrofit, that is a really, really great time to consider making your plumbing gray water ready. Um, you can save yourself quite a bit of money doing that and, and a lot of hassle down the road. Um, or if you're going to be, you know, tearing out your garden and you're putting in a whole new front and backyard garden and you're putting in new hardscape and decks and whatever the case may be, and you're already running new lines and you're putting in new irrigation system, then that's a fantastic time to put these systems in because you're, you can just like with a remodel, you can really take advantage of some of the, um, of some of the work being done. So that's a great time to kind of piggyback some of the costs. Um, and like I said earlier, to really make sure you're using a plumber with great work experience. Um, and we're just at about an hour. I don't want to go too long. So I'm going to go through a couple of the types of systems. I'm not going to go into too much detail of these, but I want to just show you kind of what's out there. So another uh, manufacturer called Rewater Systems. Um, very similar to the system I just showed you. It just doesn't have the bioreactor component that actually um, breaks down the bacteria. So in these systems, you cannot store the water. You're basically using the water as it's being created. So very similar to the other system, you've got your tank here with the pump and filter. Gray water comes out of the house, goes through a filter, and pumps out immediately. So in this system, it's going to work the same, just without, without the storage component. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, just because we're at about an hour, and I want to leave some time for some questions. So in this system, it just uses more or less a sand filter you'd see on a regular pool to filter the water out and send it to the garden. Here you've got some valves that are going to uh, control the gray water flow to the garden. This is a very similar to the... Other system, we have our actuated three-way three valve, which allows you to switch from your sewer to gray water system. Um, let's see, next slide, there we go. And so this is our this is our basin. This is, we just built a little small vault around it to access it and cover it up when not, when not being serviced. Um, this is another type of um, uh, subsurface drip irrigation. And so 
you know, like I was saying before, one of the benefits of being able to use the irrigation system that is already there is you don't have to go to a system like this, where this is a very proprietary kind of drip irrigation system. And this can be very cost prohibitive and having to put this kind of system in and change our gray water part, uh, irrigation parts out. So I want to show this slide after seeing the previous system is you don't have to go to all this effort to put all these components in, dig up the soil, dig up the plants, put this in and reinstall things. So um, the more you can avoid this, the better. But if, if you're going to put in gray water, uh, an irrigation system anyways, this is, you know, the optimal time to do these kind of retrofits. So this is just an example of that kind of system. Here's another kind of uh, more simple, um, smaller system. Um, this is Aqua 2 system. Um, uses a smaller filter, a little less expensive, um, but not quite as robust of filtration, but you can fit it almost anywhere. Here's just another example of a three valve. Um, it all gets covered up when done. Here's a picture of it. Here is, you know, some purple pipe, which is the gray water appropriate drip line before the plants got put in, just kind of seeing how it would get installed subsurface in a garden. Um, and this is another system. This is a, a flow tender type system. So, you know, one of the th things you'll see in all these systems is you have the basic component of the underground basin catching water from the bathroom with a pump and filter, pump it out into the garden. So these are all just various examples, but all more or less the same basic concept of having your basin with a pump filter before it goes out to your plant area. Um, so each manufacturer has their own little kind of different way of doing it, different components. Um, so just kind of showing you what the different options are out there. And it's that same system after it's been covered up. So very discreet, kind of hidden in the garden by some camellia plants. Um, this is another system made by Irigray. Here's some kind of, so this is another system. It's got a few parts that are exposed. You know, so every, every system has its, you know, different kind of footprint in terms of um, equipment being used. And here's that's being covered. This is kind of still during construction. And that is it. You guys made it through all these slides. I really appreciate it. I know there's so much information to cover. I try my best to get it all in there and try to make it so it's not too much jargon. And now let's open up to some questions. So can, if you wanna lead us in some questions. Absolutely, that was quite a lot of information, Alan. I know, I'm sorry, wow. so, so much. <laughs> Oh, a lot more than the first class that we, you know, uh, that you had did, um, you know, that focused mainly on just sort of like the basics of a gray water system, like a laundry to true laundry to uh, landscape, uh, low gravity fed, no tech sort of thing. But this is really advanced here. Yeah. And, 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 and then, you know, I, I always like to look that there's like a system for everybody. So, you know, I, I, I cover all these just to show that, you know, if, if one system doesn't work for you or one's out of someone's cost range, expectation range, you can kind of find something that'll work for everybody. And so I, 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 don't, I don't like to say one is better than the other, but just saying there's, there's lots of options to consider. And so, yeah, no, this is, important. this is fantastic. I mean, I, I yeah. learned a whole bunch today. Um, great, great. So that's, that's great. So we do have a few questions here. Let yeah, me sure. uh, go back and, and address. So, um, First question is, does the previous class discuss what type of soaps, body washes, shampoos, and conditioners are safe for the gray water system? Yeah, yeah, I definitely covered that before. And then uh, just a really quick, um, you know, if someone wants to find out, there's a there's a website called the Cosmetic Database, um, which has a kind of a, a really great breakdown that's going to tell you what's in all your different household um, products. Um, but one thing I would say, you know, nowadays there's so many options for sustainable products. It, it's, it's not nearly as difficult as it was even five or 10 years ago. I, I would say there's almost more options for gray water appropriate products than non gray water appropriate products at this point. There's just, there's a ton of stuff out there. It's uh, a simple search online and you could find almost endless stuff that'll work. But I would say that for the most part, when, especially for like laundry stuff, um, laundry washing products, if it's if it's clear and it's liquid, it's probably about a ninety five percent chance it's going to be great water appropriate. So you always want to stay away from the, the definitely can't use the detergent like the granular ones. Those all have salts in it. But it's it's I usually don't go into too much in depth part of this in my talk because there's so much information out there about that. It's it's really easy to find the products that will work for that. 
Okay, great. Um, so the next question here is, um, if you go back, there was a slide that you had put up on installation yes. of the gray water system in, um, uh, in a two-story application there. So if you scroll yeah. up to, uh, I know exactly. There's like a house. Yeah. So so two stories can be um, can be yes. challenging. That's um, it. So. So I would say for the most part, um, the bad news is I would say in most instances, you're not going to be able to get water from a second story house. And the reason being is the plumbing from the second story, all that plumbing gets mixed in with your toilet between the first and second floor. So you can't separate your toilets from the other fixtures upstairs unless you want to open up the ceilings and the walls. And in most instances, people are just not going to want to go to that effort. It's just, it's just too cost prohibitive. And that's why I was mentioning earlier, some of the, one of the best times to do these kind of pro these projects is during a, a home remodel. So if, if opening up your ceiling and a wall just for a gray water system isn't worth the cost, if you're going to be doing a remodel and already opening things up and they're breaking down walls and running new pipes, it's the perfect time to sort of replumb your, your house and add that second line for a gray water system. So, so as it is, if you're not going to be doing a remodel, I would say most two-story houses, unfortunately, you're not going to get that upstairs bathroom. And the bummer is usually in most two-story houses, the master bedroom is upstairs, and that's what usually uses the most amount of gray water. So, the, and actually this house, the only reason why that pipe, you can see the pipe is running down the outside of the house. They put that pipe in because this house had just gotten remodeled right before this project. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's sort of the, the one limitation with two-story houses. It's, it, it makes the plumbing a little more tricky, unless it's a new construction or remodel. Yeah, so, that, so it doesn't necessarily mean, okay, it's, it, it's easier to put in a gray water system for a two-story house versus a single-story house. Yeah, it's actually harder. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Um, is there, is there another option besides, you know, how you ran the, the pipe on the side of the house? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can definitely run it through the walls. Um, but that just used it has to be happen when the walls are exposed, just cause it's, you know, opening up your walls while someone's living in the home and not doing remodel. Just most people are just, it's, you're talking adding an extra five to ten thousand dollars onto the project just to do that one part, and most people are just the numbers just don't make sense for a lot of people to spend that much money for just the gray water system. But if you're already if you're already doing a large remodel and you're already you know financing this large project, adding that pipe at that time is really not much more money, so it's kind of the perfect time to do it. Okay, yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Um, what if for you know, let's talk a little bit about permitting. Um, yes, yes. I know because you had mentioned permitting systems. How hard is it to get permits for, for systems like this? Um, if for someone who's done a lot of gray water systems, it, it's I think it's pretty easy. If, if so, if, if you're going to be getting a permit, I really I can't emphasize enough having someone who has done an extensive amount of gray water systems to be involved in the permitting process. Um, for someone who's not really savvy with the gray water code and what to include in a permit, it can probably be a nightmare. Um, Cause the, mo the, the challenge is most cities, it's still new enough to most cities that they kind of don't know what to look for or what to ask for. And so they very much err on the side of caution and they make you jump through a lot of extra hoops or do a lot of redundant elements to the design that don't necessarily need, need to be there. So if you're working with someone who doesn't know how to navigate that process, it can be kind of a, Kind of a pain but if, if it is someone who's aware of the chapter 16 gray water plumbing code and has installed these systems it's actually not that not that difficult so, some of these families are like uh i'll give a shout out to like city of saratoga um san carlos um san bruno san mateo they're actually they're amazing um palo alto and sunnyvale are pretty good too um some of these families are just are fantastic they really really embrace gray water um San Jose can be a bit of a nightmare. I'm from San Jose and I've got a lot of San Jose permits and they, they're like just the worst. Um, but it's, I'm not saying don't do it, but just, you know, every, every, every city is going to be a little bit different. 
usually, usually the smaller municipalities are going to be easier because there's fewer people to have to like check off on these systems. Um, I would say, you know, the more prepared you are when you get in there, you know, really documenting what kind of system you're using, what plumbing changes you're going to be making, how you're going to be using the, the, the water in the garden and really having all the information there on the first trip is really paramount just because it's going to be less back and forth with the city, less questions are going to ask. Um, yeah, the, the, the permitting can be, um, it can be a bit of a minefield. But still, and, and it's not, it's just, it's, but it's still new. A lot of times you go into the city and sometimes the person at the permit desk will have never even seen a gray water system, doesn't even really understand what it is when you're asking about it. So that, that part can be a little bit challenging. So, yeah. yeah. Would you yeah. say it's easier to retrofit a system um, with a non-permitting process? Uh, something that, you know, you had talked about a gravity fed system just mm -hmm. doesn't require electricity and um, even, even, a gravity, even a gravity feed system will require a permit because um, you're still so, modifying the plumbing. I see. So pretty much all system that you're touching would would require a permit, essentially. Right. Yeah. Any, anything. Everything will require a permit except laundry systems, regardless oh, of what, what regardless of what manufacturer or it's gravity feed or pump system or indoor use or non use they're all going to require a permit um for so. for the gray water the 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 kitchen the sink the yeah. toilet yeah. uh okay okay great um so the next question is um maybe you could talk a little bit about the bio reactor tank mm -hmm. um does it work similar to a septic system um you know, uh, somewhat similar because, uh, you know, septic system is basically using just kind of, you know, the leach field with microbes that kind of break down the uh, organic matter. But those leach fields that to break it down can that that is a is a really long process. I mean, some of that some of those organic matters in a, in a septic system can take months, years to break down this bioreactor. You're breaking down organic. You're breaking down the organic matter in this in the gray water in a matter of days. So it's, you know, within 20, 40, 24 to forty hours. Um, so it, it is it is just an expedited um, process, but not too different than a septic system. But it's also not the water is the water is not as dirty as a septic system as well too. So ha having an if you see in that, that slide where I showed that little box. Um, so you're basically using this. Um, this little green box, which is just is like a, a giant fish tank pump, air pump. And it just pumps an enormous amount of air into that. And basically what the air does is it keeps the water from going um, anaerobic. And so by, by keeping the oxygen there, you're like jump starting all these beneficial microbes. And those beneficial microbes is what's breaking down all that gray water in there. And so literally you're just using, you're just using um, just the, the, nature's biology to break down a water and you're, you're keeping oxygen is just keeping the microbes alive, which is, it's, it's really fascinating because you're not having to add like any chemicals. You're just literally just, and then you, to this system, you don't even, you don't even need to inoculate with like some microbes. It just, you're basically just using naturally occurring microbes that are already there in the water, which is, which is, I think to me is just the coolest. I, I, I'm really fascinated by these kind of systems. Yeah, no, that's so really you're, not, you're not having to add, you're not having to like, add some kind of a stimulant to, to jumpstart the, the beneficial microbes or, you know, buy something or add something or check the pH or just as long as it gets oxygen, the beneficial microbes are going to break, break down their gray water. And, you know, it's, it's, even though it's kind of a, a little more advanced system, you're still using some really basic concepts to clean the water, which I, I find fascinating. So th there's a question here, Alan says for the, for this bioreactor uh, system, um, Folks are asking, how often do the microbes need to be replaced? Never. So you're saying never. So they're just sort of right. there. As long, as long as there's oxygen there, you know, it's just like a compost system. You know, like if you if you just kind of if you start piling leaves and 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 you know you add right about a greens and browns or compost system, and you're kind of piling it and like on the soil, you're going to get microbes from the soil. You know, worms and you know mycelia and you know decompose are going to come right out of the soil and break down your compost. So it's, it's very similar to that same. You're just using naturally occurring microbes to, to do the, the cleaning work, which I think is awesome. 
So you're, just, when, you're, just, you're just replicating like nature's natural systems to clean the water. On, to, on, on top of a, a pre-filter and, and a membrane filter is, is working in conjunction with it, but the microbes are what kind of do that, that last stage of cleaning. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and how many bioreactor uh, tanks would a normal house need? Like one, just, two? Just one, just one. And so the, so if, if you look at this, um, if you look at this slide right here, so if you see how there's like uh, multiple membranes, yeah. So on, on a small home, let's say if it's a home of, can, everyone can see my can see the slide still. I'm showing. Maybe if you can full screen it a little bit there. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So if you see, there's it has this little kind of a uh, mem uh, like the, that's manifold that it sits on. And depending on how many people are living in the home will dictate how many of these little membranes you have. So a household of like maybe three to five people might have just one of these membranes. Let's say you've got a little larger household. Maybe there's, you know, anywhere from five to eight people live in there. You might have two. Um, and then this one is for like a commercial scenario where I think there's, there's six of them. Um, so, and then let's say it's a really big, uh, you know, residential or a school or a gym or something like that, you might have a whole other manifolds. You could have as many as, you know, 12 or 18 of these um, and, you're just, and you're basically getting a larger tank. So, so, so you, you could still have just one single reactor, just more filters inside of the reactor. Mm -hmm. Most households, most residential scenarios, one, maybe two of, the ver two of these membranes at the very most, and they could all be fit into one single tank. And, and that little bioreactor tank is basically the size of a large trash can. So imagine if you just buried, you know, this, this trash can you have at your, at your home for the, the city pickup, just burying that in the ground, is, that's basically the size of these bioreactors. So it's not, it's not like some huge septic tank pack system. They're, they're still pretty compact. So if you see, you know, this, this little bioreactor, this thing is about 30 inches across, or I'm sorry, 18 inches across and 30 inches deep. So oh, really that's small. pretty small. Okay. Yeah, basically, basically the size of a garbage can. Yeah. And, 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 if, it is, and if it is like a, a pretty substantial uh, residency, like several bathrooms and, huh? you know, like, a, a you know, several sinks and all that, would you yeah. size up for sure? Yeah. So we just we just did one in Los Gatos um, last month and that bioreactor, it was about I think 36 inches across and like five feet deep. So, you know, it is size like one of the, maybe, you know, there's the big like rolling, the rolling garbage can sizes so is maybe like that size. Okay. You know, whereas this one is like kind of the old school kind of 30 gallon trash cans. So mm -hmm. as is just like a size comparison, but still, okay. I mean, re still relatively small. They're not, they're not a huge, you know, massive thing. All right. A um, couple more questions here and then we'll wrap up. This one's very yeah. specific. Um, so if the toilet showers and sinks um, are all on an upstairs second floor, um, uh -huh. uh, second floor and are on exterior wall, how hard is it to run the plumbing system through the wall and down the exterior wall to the bioreactor? If, I mean, if you have to open up the walls, I would say expensive, not, not, not cheap, unfortunately. Um, and it really depends on what kind of, you know, material, you know, what, how hard is every house is built differently? You know, how big is access is the side of the house? Um, do you have ABS plumbing? Do you have old copper plumbing? I mean, every house is totally different. So there's just so many variables. But I'd say if, if you're opening up walls and having to open up ceilings, I mean, just that one portion of the project, you're probably looking ten ten thousand dollars just for that one wall and all that plumbing. It's a that that two story houses is a is a whole different beast. It's a whole different beast. Um, and that's kind of that's why I was really emphasizing doing this during a remodel. I I, I cannot emphasize that is the most ideal time to do these systems. I mean, just like solar, like, hey, the best time to do solar is when you're putting in a new roof, you know, um, so, or the best time to redo irrigation is when you're redoing your landscape, you know, so 
it's, it's no different than these other like home remodel projects. There's like optimal time to do it, you know? So, you know, that's, you know, kind of timing it right at that. And even if you don't want to put in a whole gray water system dur during a remodel project, you can at least put the plumbing in place and you can make your, you can make your house gray water ready. And so at that point down the road, you can, you can do the gray water portion, the landscape portion at, at any time, but you want to, the, the most difficult part of these projects by far, by far is the interior plumbing work. Cause it's, it's the one thing that's the most specialized. It's the hardest to get to. Um, it's the part that requires all the permits, you know, so getting that plumbing work done at the right time is going to just save you a fortune. Um, and that's, I, that's, I, I would say that if anyone's listening to this, like, that's like the biggest takeaway I can, I can give to people is, is do this kind of stuff, either doing a new construction or a major ret retrofit. And that's the follow-up question here. So, for new construction, how hard is it to um, get permitting for a system like that versus a retrofitted system with existing plumbing? Yeah, new construction is by far the easiest um, for a lot. One, it's great because you're already everything's exposed. There's there's no finish work. There's lots of times no stucco, no painting, no drywall. Adding that pipe is literally sometimes only a couple hundred dollars worth of parts. It's just literally adding a few extra ABS pipes, adding a three-way valve very inexpensive. And then you already, lots of times you're already working with an engineer architect who's already drafting a plans. You're already pulling permits anyway. So you're already going through the, the, the process of working with the city. So you can really, really pick that. I mean, new construction is by far the best. I mean, absolutely by far the best, but also at the same time, even though that's the best time to do it, you, you, you really, really have to have someone who knows how to like only a small amount of changes need to be done to make it gray water ready, but you have to have someone who knows how and when to make those changes to make the system work right. I, mean, I I've literally worked on no exaggeration, a hundred projects where I get called in like, Hey, we're doing, we're building a brand new house. We're trying to make it, um, you know, water safe. We're adding a bunch of eco-conscious uh, strategies, um, solar systems and hydronic heating and, you know, high tech um, insulation, all these things, you know, energy star windows and they want to do gray water and like oh my, my plumbers here doing it and I, I not to be mean to, to plumbers but i would say almost every time a plumber does it without experience he and i have not once ever seen a plumber do it right and it's not to be a bunch of plumbers there's it's just it's it's just a very specific part of plumbing that it's it kind of goes against a lot of plumbers are trained so it, it, you really got to have someone who knows gray water system specifically to work with your plumber to consult with the plumber to make sure the plumber can then do the small upgrades correctly. So the, yeah. any, any plumber could do the work, but he just needs a little bit of coaching with the, the gray water designer to get those things done at the right, not only the right time, but the right, you know, the right, um, the right modifications. And so that timing and, and just the coordination between the contractors is, is really, really key. Cause I've seen so many times where it's not done at the right time or it's not the right communication and they, they put a lot of effort in doing it and it doesn't get done right because the plumber doesn't have the information he needs to do it correctly. So yeah. that's it's really, really key to have that coordination. In your experience, how often do new construction, uh, residential new construction or even commercial consider installing a system like this? Never, <laughs> so. never ever. I mean, that's, I hate to be mean, but it's just the truth. The construction industry is just is so slow on doing this. And most contractors, just saving water is not anywhere close to what's important to them. For 99% for of them, they just, I want to build the house. I want to get it done, move on to the next project. And so most times when, when, I, when I'm a part of a project doing this is because the homeowner is really saying, hey, I want to do this. And they are pushing the contractor to, to help them get it done. But most contractors or most home builders never. I mean, the, mo most time when I'm working, I, I'm having to like, oh, like really struggle to get the contractor to give this priority in the project, work with their plumbers to do it right and do it at the right time because they just they it's and it's it's like any job they want to just get the job done and move on next get paid move on next project you know so it's nothing that they they don't have any bad intentions it's just you, you're it's it's tricky because you that this. You know, these home builders have been kind of building a home the same way for the last hundred years, you know. And so now all of a sudden, hey, we're going to totally change how you're going to do plumbing and how you're going to put gray water systems. It's, you're kind of having to retrain a lot of people. And most times they're just like, I, 
I got my way of doing it and this is how I'm going to do it. And so it's, it's, they, they very, very, very rarely prioritize this, which is unfortunate. And so I think, I think a, a big part of it, they, the, the, the legislation has changed to make it easier to do this, but there's no incentive base yet to do it. The, most of these systems, there's no ROI, unfortunately. I mean, most people ask me, is there, I, I always say, if, 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 if you're only doing this because you want the ROI, don't do it because there is no ROI. I'll, I'll be totally blunt. You know, uh, I'm not going to trick anyone to think that you're going to save a lot of money. You, you really, you can, you can make it more cost effective. There's ways you can save a thousand dollars by making it more cost effective. But because the price of water is so cheap and we don't pay, like what we pay in a water bill is not the true cost of water. There is no ROI in these systems. I'd just be totally blunt. Um, so there's no, there's no financial incentive structure to make contractors and homeowners do this. You only, the only people who are pushing this are crazy people like me and homeowners who really want to save water because they think it's the right thing to do and they want to be socially conscious and environmentally conscious. Um, so there's right now, there's no financial benefit to doing it, which is really unfortunate. I wish there's more uh, incentives like solar um, rebates to push people to do this. So that's what we really, really need to have happen is there's, we got to, one, um, it's, it's been proposed before, but there's been so much pushback from the construction industry, but, but forcing all new construction to be gray water ready, that, that is going to be the absolute game changer to these kind of systems happening. Because then these contractors and plumbers will be forced to not put, not put in a gray water system, but, but make the plumbing gray water ready. So at any point, a homeowner can say, hey, I want to put a gray water system in. I can just plug into a pipe that's already there that was put in when the, when the home was being built. So there's no additional cost at that point. There's no, there's no new permitting. There's no new back and forth with the city and contractors. The infrastructure in the home is already there. And then homeowner can choose or, or to or not to put in a gray water system at any point down the road. And so that, that will be the really game changing point is when they make legislation that, great, that all new construction or major remodels be retrofitted with a gray water connection. Until that happens, it's gonna be really hard to really make the numbers work. Unfortunately. Yeah, this is, this is, I mean, this is much needed because I mean, imagine all <laughs> millions of houses with the gray water system. It, 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 it's, it's a bummer because there's so many opportunities for it. And it's just that we're still trying to connect a few more dots to really connect the people who want to do the right thing and make it financially uh, palatable for people. Because something like this, like, well, why am I going to spend ten, twenty thousand dollars or more to do these kind of systems if I don't get my money back. And so I, I don't blame them. Um, so that we just need more financial um, incentives to push this. And right now it's, it's kind of just early adopters who just like, hey, I, I want to do it because it's the smart and right thing to do. And the more we get people like that who are pushing this, hopefully the legislation part will follow soon after and make it easier for the people who don't have maybe the means or the motivation or experience or inclination to do it, make it easier for them to do it, kind of follow behind them. Yeah. That's my yeah. soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> I can go no, on. No, that's, it's, that's that's it's the truth. Of I don't, I don't, I don't want to ever trick people into thinking it's, you know, it's just like golden ticket to save water. You know, that's, it's, it's an option and it's getting there, but it's not like a perfect thing that's inexpensive that anyone can do. It, it's, it's tricky. It's really is tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is really the right thing to do, but you're right. I Financial do. incentives uh, are not there. And do yeah. you know any cities or counties that are, you know, I know there's, um, there's the rainwater uh, barrel rebates uh, that yeah. some of the cities and counties do, yeah. uh, or so, like, so you know, some, even pg e offers like a, a high efficiency appliance rebate or something like that. Uh, do you know of any rebates for uh, components of such systems? So right now, the only real rebates are for laundry systems. And it's unfortunate right now, it's only $200 for laundry system rebate. Um, the city of Palo Alto, and I believe um, Gilroy match it 50%, uh, one to one. So they'll give you an extra $200. So if you're in Palo Alto, you can get $400 back. $400 back. Um, you can get... And the other rebate is for uh, is for rainwater systems. So you can get a, a one. Uh, I'm sorry. You can get 50 cents rebate for every one for every one gallon of storage. 
So let's say you have a 2000 gallon tank or a 1000 gallon tank, you can get anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars as a rebate. And then the city of Palo Alto will match that one to one. So they'll, they'll double that rebate. So if you're getting a thousand back, you'll get 2000 back in the city of Palo Alto, which is, I wish more municipalities did that. I think that's actually a really, it's enough of a rebate to kind of really incentivize people to do it, or at least kind of push them along a little bit to, to make it easier to, um, to uh, embrace doing a system like this. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And um, yeah. here's one last question. I mean, this is this is really informative. Thank you for doing this class, by the way. Um, no problem. Thank you. Um, the last question here is: Do you know uh, of plants that are not very receptive to water from a gray water system like this? Um, can regular folks grow like vegetables and fruits? Oh, yeah, yeah just oh, yeah. fine with so like 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 a few uh if I go up to the, this opening slide in here it's kind of hard to see in this picture i'll go to the large screen oh no i want to go back here sorry uh um, let me go back to the slide yeah you can so basically the, the only limitations to um so if you look at this picture um in there in this front yard, they have the, all these little um, metal raised beds, these core tan raised beds all have edible um, edible plants in there. So they have a whole herb garden. This this picture was from this last fall, but in this, the previous summer, they had just tomato plants and squash and fruit trees that were, I mean, you, you could barely even see the little walkway leading up to the house because there's they had so much fruit growing and veggies growing in this house. and. So the only real limitations in terms of what you can water. Um, so you you want to you want to make sure whatever soap product you're using isn't going to change the pH. So you want to be using like pH neutral products um, because some plants you know like to have a very especially um, like acid loving plants like to have a very um, specific pH. Some soaps can be on the basic side. So that's that's the main consideration in terms of what plants to water. Um, certain plants that like to have that don't like having their feet wet really wet you know a lot, a lot of drought tolerant natives and you know and non-native drought tolerant plants like to have deep infrequent watering some gray water systems are going to give like a little bit of day like daily water every day so those kind of plants may not be good so plants that like being in a little more of like a riparian zone kind of more maybe more like wetland plants or fruit trees um you know those are all plants that like having a lot of water um, I love I love watering fruit trees with gray water because you're not only getting the benefit of reusing the water, you're getting fruit out of it. Um, trees also create habitat. They create shade. Um, they they just have a, a bunch of other secondary benefits. Um, so I always like to water you know shrubs and trees whenever possible. But the, the main consideration is you know check your pH, make sure they're not irrigating acid loving plants. Um, and you know, certain drought tolerant plants don't like having that kind of soggy feet where they're getting water every day because some gray water systems will irrigate every day. Okay, great. All right, well, those were all the questions, Alan. Um, cool. This is this is a whole bunch of information that you just yeah. presented here. No I problem. think it's gonna. I know. I, I, I always feel a challenge trying to get so much information in one little uh, talk. So I hope it wasn't too much jargon. I hope I didn't speed everything too much. Um, if anyone has more questions, they can always email me at alan at baymaples. It's A-L-A-N at baymaples.com. Um, go to our website, baymaples. You know, I, I like to help homeowners, even, even if you don't have us work with you, if you just, I like getting people the information out there. That's the most important thing to me. So, you know, feel free to call or email us. And, you know, I, I like just, w whether they have us do it or do it themselves or someone else, just like, I just want people doing these systems, you know, just kind of yeah. pushing the narrative of, of saving water. So. Yeah, and make it fun. Gardening, gardening has to be fun. Find a way to make it fun and enjoyable, you know. And so that that to me is like the most paramount thing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Alan. <laughs> this is great. This is fantastic yeah. as always. So um, yeah. again, this class is being recorded and will be available to everybody to watch under community awesome. resources page. So um, thanks, Alan, and I'll cool. reach out if there are questions um, from you <laughs> viewers in the future. Thanks, Ken. I really appreciate you having me and hosting me and helping out. Really appreciate it. Alrighty. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. See you later. Thanks, everyone.